Hello, my name is Thomas. Welcome to British Culture Albion Never Dies. We have a slightly longer episode than usual because I wanted to give you as much of the interview as I could with Roland Hume, a British novelist who I invited on to talk about the role of formula and structure in stories and of course naturally we're gravitating to the Bond films and the Bond stories, uh, the novels by Ian Fleming and indeed you can check out his channel on YouTube, Roland Hume, uh, where he talks about, well as a novelist gives his perspective on writing, whether it's writing about the Bond films, the best written Bond films, the worst written Bond films, or more recently about uh, the Ian Fleming novels which of course will be re-released this year, uh, 70 years on from their original release. And uh, and I've been talking about the, uh, well, Bond books and books that appear in Bond films on my YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com forward slash British culture. So, we have joined forces. <laughs> you two have joined forces? <laughs> we have joined forces, and I am so happy to have him on again. So please do enjoy this interview with a British novelist about story structure. Roland, thank you very much for joining me once again. Oh, thank you for having me once again. I haven't overstayed my limit yet. Absolutely not. It's always open se- open ticket, open season, open ticket. <laughs> <laughs> open season. <laughs> <laughs> Already my first slips. Um, <laughs> so talking about formula today, you said something yes. really interesting in one of your YouTube videos. And I think we've talked about this before, that you love formula as a writer. I do. I absolutely adore formula as a writer. And I think it's right. A lot of people say bad things about formula and they say, oh, it's so formulaic and stuff like that. But storytelling is by definition formula. I mean, we had our caveman ancestors gathered around the campfire telling stories and they established like what is a satisfying story. And it's like a story arc, a story circle. Mm. And I mean, so many people who have uh, who've defined, you know, this is the story. This is how you tell a story. This is how you tell a story. But it all comes back to the same thing, this formula of storytelling of, of you know, introducing the character, the character conflicts, the character resolution and the end point. And I'm I'm like a good story should be formulaic in a certain way. It should fit all of these beats and be satisfying. And if you don't fill all these beats, then it's not a satisfying story. And um, I think formula gets a bad rap. But actually, I think formula can be a very, very powerful and satisfying thing. So there's good formula and bad formula, or is it the way it's enacted? I think there's formula where it gets a bit formulaic. I mean, I was thinking we we have we enjoy similar TV shows and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I grew up on on repeats of all the 60s TV shows like The Avengers and The Saint and stuff. And it's the A Team. I love the A Team, yeah. Knight Rider, and like those shows were okay. This happens in the first, this happens in the cold open. Then we have this first act, this second act, third act, boom, done. And it was a formula every week. <laughs> I think and it's yes. in the second series that Face says, well, why don't we just go fight them, lose, then gather ourselves together, come up with some kind of plan, and then just defeat them. And they all shrug and carry on with what they're doing. Well, absolutely. Um, and it's in some ways, though, it's really enjoyable. Like you sit down and you watch the Dukes of Hazard or the A team or even to a certain extent, like Star Trek or something like that. And you know what you're getting. Mm. It's like when you when you sit down and have a roast beef dinner, you want your roasted potatoes, you want your Yorkshire puddings, you want your, your roast beef, you want your gravy. And it's like, if you don't, if one of those things is missing, mm. then, you know, it's unsatisfying. I remember my brother-in-law, who's a brilliant cook, he once cooked his roast dinner and he didn't cook Yorkshire puddings. And I'm like, what's the point? Might as well get a bowl of cereal. <laughs> I have the same reaction if I have a full English breakfast with no black pudding. Yeah, oh, it, black pudding. missing. It's uh, I do, do, do American listeners maybe know what black pudding is? Blood sausage, I think, is mm. something they call it, don't they? Yes, yeah, yeah, the Germanic it's, term for it. It sounds revolting, but it's actually like delicious, and it is one it of is. the essential ingredients. You can't have a breakfast like that without without it. I certainly can't. I did a podcast with my friend Kane all about uh, traveling around the UK. And we discovered throughout our travels that the English breakfast had changed in different parts of the UK and different parts of the UK were mm-hmm. come up with strong views about this cannot be an English breakfast. But clearly we, we cling to our formula. Yeah, 
And you need to. And it, we were talking about Bond films as well, which was where formula is, you know, the Bond films have a formula. And if you mm. decide to make Quantum of Solace and you like to be all postmodernist and follow the Jason Bourne thing and miss out certain things like the gun barrel sequence and stuff, then it ends up not 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 being satisfying. Mm. OK. What I find interesting, I, I mean, I became a Bond fan really when I read the Fleming books and I found it so interesting because... Yeah. It takes him a while to work out James Bond as he's writing the books. And I, yeah. that rarely grabbed me. And once he's found a formula, he clearly gets bored with it and then has a few different like experiments and so on, which I rarely enjoy. That's something I, I, I gravitate towards. Um, but you are in praise of formula. I am, although that's a, that's a very, very valid point. I mean, I think I did a really deep breakdown of Casino Royale and that follows the storytelling formula. There are various ways you can look at it, but there's one, there's a guy called Dan Harmon who does Rick and Morty and stuff like that. And he wrote this wonderful thing called the story circle, which is, you know, there are eight points in a story. And then you read Casino Royale and you realize it hits each of those perfectly. And it might not be the Bond formula, but it's a good story mm. formula. And all of the Ian Fleming books tend to be, I mean, some of them miss the mark a bit but they've followed the story of uh, the formula of a story but it's the movies that established like the bond formula yeah the movies definitely have its formula um why do you think we like it so much i think because it's satisfying i think with a good book or something like that you get that dopamine release i'm reading raymond benson who wrote the some of the continuation novels he wrote a, a, a mystery book called the mad mad murders of marigold way and it's a mystery book and i'm reading it now and i'm just like this is satisfying you read it and it's like it's a story so it follows the story things but when you find a new revelation or a new piece of information that pieces together to make the uh, the others fit it gives you that like little dopamine rush Hmm. And it's like a good formula when you tick the boxes. It's like you watch a James Bond film and there's a gun barrel sequence and you get that little rush of dopamine. You're like, oh, yeah. And then there's the cold <laughs> open, which is super exciting. And it ends with a Bond theme and you're like, oh, yeah. And then you've got the Bond theme and you're like, oh, yes. And then you get the picture of the Houses of Parliament and <laughs> Big Bane going ding dong, ding dong. And it's M's office and Bond walks in, and you are like, yes. And then he goes and gets his gadgets from Q and Q's mean to him. And you're like, I'm all here for this. And, then he goes to <laughs> and it's it's like ticking a box, but you're going on a journey and it's a familiar journey, but it's different every time because he's going to different locations and he has different gadgets and he does things. But you want to have these these core ingredients, your mm. the Yorkshire puddings and your, your uh, gravy with all of these things because it makes it so satisfying. There's expectations being met. Yes. And you can do interesting things and subvert expectations, and that can work or can't work. But it's the expectations, I think, are something that's so intrinsic and important. Can you give me an example of when expectations are subverted and it's a good thing? Well, actually, yeah, you could do. I was in a, the Bond movie context. You could look at maybe Casino Royale. Mm. which I think was a very, very well-written movie. And it oh, was yeah. actually very loyal to the the Bond book. But they subverted expectations a bit by having, oh, you know, they, they didn't have the gun barrel sequence in the beginning. Mm. And then the opening scenes are filmed in black and white. And then it's like, okay, this is different, but it's different, but it, it's kind of like um, self-aware of being different. It's like, we know what the formula is and we're coming at you with something slightly different that gives a nod to the fact that we know you know what the formula is. Quantum of Solace was like, oh, we're not going to have the gun barrel sequence. We're not going to have the, the Q briefing scene. We're not going to have this. We're not going to have that. And that was unsatisfying because it wasn't there. Whereas Casino oh. Royale did a little twist on all of them that was satisfying. Okay. So we like what we like, but a little bit different. Yeah, and I think that's it. You watch a Bond film and you want you want the same thing, but you want it with a slight twist. Mm. Or just like a little zesty lemon squeezed on it to, to make it a bit different. So for you, Quantum of Solace was a twist too far? I think Quantum of Solace just didn't... It almost came as like a fourth act to Casino Royale. It oh, just yeah. seemed okay. incomplete. Okay. And you, know, you used the term formulaic earlier, which is interesting. Formula can be a good thing, but we don't normally say formulaic in a positive sense. Yeah, and I almost... I think, especially with books, there's a kind of, I think we get certain, uh, to a certain extent, we get a little pretentious about this. And, you know, Lee Child is a wonderful writer and his books, to a certain extent, are kind of formulaic. It's like, 
Jack Reacher, he's a big tough guy and he's wandering through the American Midwest and then he gets a message and has to reluctantly come and solve this mystery. And they are formulaic, but you read them and you enjoy them and you could read them out of sequence and enjoy the books. Mm. And you know that if Lee Child is going to uh, publish a new Jack Reacher book, you're like, okay, I know what I'm getting. <laughs> and so there's something safe and satisfying about knowing what you're getting. I saw an American comedian talk about Tom Cruise and was pointing out that in the yeah. firm, he's a really good lawyer, but he has kind of a personal crisis, meets a beautiful woman and becomes an even better lawyer. And then it was like in Mission Impossible, he's a spy and he's a really good spy, but then he has a personal crisis, meets a beautiful woman and becomes an even better spy. And The Last Samurai, he's a soldier, he's a really good soldier, but then he has a personal crisis, meets a beautiful woman, becomes an even better soldier. And he's like, I don't know what Tom Cruise's next film is. Um, let's see. <laughs> He's a tennis player, then he was probably going to be a really good tennis player, and then I'll probably have a really deep personal crisis, meet a beautiful woman, and become an even better tennis player. You know, it's I love it. I, <laughs> yeah, and and you know, to his credit, that's not necessarily Tom Cruise's formula. That's the 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 story circle of the eight points. It's like uh it's you can get so nerdy about it. You have a story circle and it's split into four quadrants, and the top half is um order, and the mm. bottom half is chaos. And the right is dishonesty and the left is honesty. So he starts off in order that's dishonest. And so that's where he's a really good lawyer. And then everything goes wrong. And he goes from um, he goes from dishonest order into dishonest chaos, where he's like, what the hell is going on? And then you get to the midpoint of the story where he meets the girl and it becomes honest chaos, where he kind of realizes his shortfalls and where he's going wrong so he has a certain honesty and introspection about himself but his life is still chaotic and then it concludes when he is honest and in order oh that is interesting because when i'm looking at this kind of story you know structures often i feel the joseph campbell's the hero's journey has i mean hollywood seems to have forgotten there are other structures (laughs) Um, yes whereas in the more russian kind of perspective you often have like equilibrium disequilibrium equilibrium which i feel is how the original bond films were that he he was as a fully formed agent like there's no question of where he's from there's no hero's journey he is the hero yes Um, he slays the dragon and then the world is good um um that i find that that with the joseph campbell's you said something just a second ago that was absolutely brilliant and was uh inspiring to me with the the going through the the different bits it is very formulaic in hollywood and it's not joseph campbell's thing it's um in the 90s somebody published a book called save the cat Mm. and it was how to write a hollywood screenplay and they broke it down into like you want to write a hollywood screenplay here the first scene is the establishing shot the second scene is this and they like did a punch list of how you how you tell your story and since the 90s every single hollywood blockbuster has followed this formula to the bit where if you read save the cat you're like oh i know what's going to happen next and it drives my my kids crazy because i'm watching something and i'll tell them what's going to happen next and then it does and they're like dad why do you always ruin this but it's because they follow a formula well, but yeah. it is a satisfying formula if you follow this formula even though you know it's a formula and even though like you all your cynicism is mm. there it ends up in a satisfying movie i watched uh the gray man uh, the Netflix yeah. blockbuster, and there was a nice, quiet, peaceful moment, and then they they suddenly have a jump scare, and my wife observed that I did not jump, and I was like, "Well, it's it's been ten, fifteen minutes without a major fight scene, so they were like, this film has had a fight every five, ten minutes so far, so <laughs> you have when you know what's coming." But I'm very curious. You are a writer, and you're aware of formula. I'm wondering, is this something that you're fully conscious of when you're writing is it something you write something and then you look back and realize it conformed or didn't conform how conscious is this process i think everyone is aware of the formula of a satisfying story and i think that's why everyone's like oh i could write a book or i've got a book inside of me and i know Mm. i look at the the books i've written and when i before i was so aware of this i wrote some cracking books and i look back at them now and i'm like oh I followed the story formula. I didn't realize I was following the story formula, but I followed it. And so it's satisfying. And then I kind of like really started leaning into it and researching and reading books Uh. like Save the Cat and stuff. And I try now to specifically follow the the circle, not just because... Um, this, a good, well, sat, uh, satisfying story is driven by characters acting Mm. in certain ways and their motivations. 
like um you start off in a traditional story with the eight points the first point is called you and that is the protagonist so you have a scene it's the same with Save the Cat. It's like you establish who your protagonist is. You have James Bond. This is your cold open. James Bond mm-hmm. is a super cool secret agent who smooches the woman, defeats the bad guy, and then um, flies off into the distance. And that's when the theme tune launches. And then the, the third point is it's called um, Go. And it's because your character needs something. And with James Bond, it's like you have to go and, and follow this super billionaire who's... De- to designing a laser or something. It's a lady French character- industrialist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the KGB must have a pipeline into that research company. It would appear so. Six months ago, that company was acquired by an Anglo-French combine, Zolin Industries. I presume, sir, there has been a security check of the plant. A very extensive one, but we have no leads. What about Zorin himself? Max Zorin, impossible. He's a leading French industrialist. But this is where these that this is where a lot of stories go wrong. Your character needs something. He can't mm. want something. If you want something, then you know, I want I want a glass of wine. That's fine. It's yeah, I've heard this it. story thing before that you know characters can't just like stuff. They have to be obsessed. Yeah, they have to need it. And then you, what you have to do in the next stage is basically the character. All stories are driven by the character needing something. The character thinking he knows how to get it, and then he goes off pursuing this. This is why the, the section is called "Go." So, like mm. James Bond said, uh, you know, he follows off to to follow the leading French industrialist, mm. and everything goes wrong. And that's where the story gets thrown into to chaos or disequilibrium. That's a, a, a great way of putting it. If I'm leaning and, back on my Joseph Campbell reading, then it's like the call, the call to action, and the hero yes. can refuse, and of course Luke Skywalker refuses, and it was as uh, so I could take it to the nearest place, um, but but he has to be forced. Um, yeah, the reluctant hero syndrome mm, kind of thing. Yes, yeah. And then from that point, when everything goes wrong, he gets thrown into this brave new world. You know, they Alice falls down the the rabbit hole into Wonderland, or. Um, yeah, Luke Skywalker disappears off into space and, and realizes the big world. And so you have to then knock your character off kilter and he has to kind of like adapt yeah. to this new. And it makes a very satisfying story because it's all driven by emotion. Your character mm. almost drives what happens. It's like you establish your character, then you give him a need and then you send him off to go and get this need and everything goes wrong. And from that point, if your character's well established enough, it's easy to know what he would do to try and solve this problem. And uh-huh. so it's all driven on emotion and conflict. And I think that's why you can follow the same formula, but it's never quite repetitive because mm. if you have an interesting character to find, he's going to react to things in, in different ways and in interesting ways. But uh, um, I, kind I can, of, uh, yeah. I can immediately think of uh, when I watched Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Mm. There's a point where he's with Hagrid and the doors open, and I've I've often thought of you know the gateway again in Campbell's writing. That's what I'm leaning on. Um, it literally is a gateway. The gate opens up. He sees the magical world, and you just see his reaction yeah. of awe. Um, it's not like he had a happy life before, but this is the point where we see him uncomfortable. Is out of his comfort zone into a magical world. So, yeah, and it's. Um, and that's interesting because yeah, he was in order because, you know, his life was very ordered. He lived under the stairs. His family was horrible to him, but there was order, even though it was dishonest order. Mm. And then he goes to Hogwarts and he has certain preconceptions about things. That's where the dishonesty comes from. But it is chaos rather than order. And then it's when he establishes himself in Hogwarts and, and starts to figure things out. That's when he reach, reaches into like the honest segment of the story, even though things are still in disorder. Mm. Or chaos. <laughs> so you have but, a magical um, world. Uh, uh, yes, a magical. And Joseph Campbell, he he wrote basically the the best version of. It. I think the one that I use, Dan Harmon's Story Circle, is very. It's a cut down, amended version of that. Whereas the Joseph Campbell one is wonderful. Where it's you know the hero's journey and going into the magic place, and he has a lot more steps. I think he has twelve steps or something. It it as it's. To say. The copy I've got, yeah, it's, it's incredibly detailed and goes into all the different iterations and byways and highways you can take. Lucas said that he read Campbell's writings, which I think it wasn't actually that condensed um, at the time. It was, he read a huge amount, then kind of, he said, threw it out the window, tried to create my own thing, and then later on realised how much into his subconscious it got and how much it matches, uh, which is why I wonder about, you know, a writer being conscious of, you know, surely you write things and then realise, oh, but it's also influenced by something, you know, something else. 
Um. Yeah, and I think all of us intrinsically know what good storytelling is. Mm. Even if we can't define it, we know what it is because we have been brought up listening to <laughs> stories and our favourite stories follow the formula kind of thing. Yeah. Although I, mean, I think... I think I'm saying that we're talking about structure and formula, I think, is something slightly different. To structure, okay. Kind of. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking I've got my rules. Like there's certain films I'll watch. Yeah. If I liked or don't like, I know. And it's, and because, did you like that? Yes. Why? I don't know. I just liked it. But then I start to think yeah. about it and I've got all my reasons. But it must have existed somewhere. For example, talking animals. No. <laughs> and that's a hard no. <laughs> if it's said, part talking... of the world. Talking animals, I watched Puss in Boots 2 the other day and it was just, it was on in the background and we wanted to have a movie for the kids and I watched it and I was like, this is a brilliant story. You know, you've got Puss in the Boots who think he's immortal and he realises he's on his last life and then he has to pursue this magic wish so he can have nine more lives and then he oh, has wow. the conflict. And I'm like, oh, this follows the formula and it's really satisfying. It does sound good. Sadly, I'll never enjoy it as it involves an animal talking within a coherent <laughs> Oh, many universe. animals talking. Oh, that's my worst nightmare. Um, I enjoy, uh, what was it, the creature comforts, because there's clearly humans yeah. and they've they've put on the animal. And so it's not supposed to be a world in which animals talk. It, it's, it's a comedy thing. So uh, I remember those. Those were the, the like the, the Wallace and Gromit style claymation yeah. animals, weren't they? I loved those. I think it was British Gas, although I think they might have been advertising for electricity rather than British Gas. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll watch them online sometimes. <laughs> um, I know. I think maybe structure is very. I think structure and formula maybe they're two separate things. Like all stories need to follow that mm. the structure. But I was thinking we're both Star Wars fans. Yeah, and yes. I've been really loving the Mandalorian. And the reason the Mandalorian from season one got it right is because it was a formula. It was a western, basically. Yeah, it was it's a Knight space Rider. western. <laughs> yeah, and it was like you know the tall dark hero. He comes in. He gets this guy he goes on a mission then he has the moral conflict of like if i follow through this mission i'm you know doing something that's bad and then he breaks the rules and everyone chases him and it is pure formula but it's yeah. so satisfying and it's set up very clear rules of the universe and when yeah. he breaks the rules there are consequences and i rarely like that that you do see consequences you do see follow-on um including just emotional consequences uh, throughout it yeah, and they managed to do that with him wearing a mask the whole time as well. Which is yes, amazing. yes, that is. And every episode, we went through this bit in the, the 2000s of having everything was kind of this big, long season-wide story arc. And I think what The Mandalorian did so successful is they had self-contained episodes. Mm. So like you could watch one out of order. And yes, there was a greater arc for the story, but also every single episode was its own self-contained story. It's like, oh, he's on Tatooine and he wants to get this guy's armor back, but the guy won't give him the armor back unless he defeats this dragon. And so he defeats the dragon and gets the armor back. And it's like, that's a whole satisfying story mm -hmm. in one. And yet it serves this broader arc of he has the armor and then he'll meet Boba Fett again and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's one of the strengths of the old Star Wars expanded universe, the books, the novels, the comics, the video games. It's insanely big, but even though it's all coherent, you know, it all ties together, it's all canon, if you will. Um, you can just pick things out randomly and enjoy them in themselves. Um, yes, and I think that's what really makes something successful. You need to be able to just take anything in isolation and read it and enjoy it and not feel like you needed to read everything else to. Oh, absolutely. To... Yeah, well, it's, it's, not like you, it's not like you could start watching Breaking Bad in season three and enjoy it. Whereas okay. I think you could watch any episode of The Mandalorian and probably enjoy it. And then if you watch yeah. all of it, you'd enjoy it more. One of the things I like, I mean, going to George Lucas's writing is that he will repeat elements. So Obi-Wan Kenobi walks into a bar with a Skywalker and cuts off somebody's arm, but he does it twice in the yeah. films, once with Anakin and once with Luke. But both times, what it does is highlights the different reactions. Luke and Anakin behave in polar opposite ways. So anytime yeah. you see Lucas repeat an element, there'll be some dramatic change, even going back to locations. Um, he'll make sure there's some interesting change to draw your eye to it. Um, so he has, to a certain extent, formula, but also change it around. Um, now, you had a quote from Lucas that you mentioned. It's like poetry. It rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> and I think... I think that's very I think that's very true and it's satisfying. Um I really enjoyed The Force Awakens as a movie. Oh, okay. And it was kind of like a remake of the original Star Wars. Yes, yeah. It had a lot of the elements that were almost exactly the same and that was satisfying. Okay. 
Oh, that's interesting. Well, are you so you you look incredulous? Did you enjoy the Force Awakens or not so much? Um, I, I, for me, I know it's a very popular film for me. I just enjoyed the Lego version more because it went into the um, more of a story, more of a unique story. So I like Lucas because yeah. he'll take risks and he'll do quite different things every time. You know, for him, having made Star Wars, it would be the easiest thing in the world just to churn out another and another and another. Yeah, and it, and it may have been short lived. But that's, you know, that would have been the easiest thing to do. And instead, he creates something that is artistically challenging and challenging to the audience in many ways, whether it's, you know, instead of the big battle at the end, it's just two people fighting at the end. The beginning battle is huge. Uh, But even just changing around the order of that, you know, the rebels lose the first battle and, you know, spoilers for The Empire Strikes Back, which came out in 1980. Um, But, you know, Luke loses the battle. Um, And and badly. (laughs) Um, So I find that really interesting that he will... He will do rarely interesting creative things. It's like with, with the prequel films, you know, that, that do get bashed until I, I pointed out to a few people, you know, the first one, episode one, is about a nine-year-old. Everything in that film yeah. is about the nine-year-old and it's from a nine-year-old's point of view. And the next one is a teen film because it's about a teenager. So everything in the film is about a teen. And the final one is about a young adult. And so it is a young adult film. Um yeah. I think George Lucas is brilliant because uh, the Clone Wars, for example, I think a lot of people don't watch that because it's just a cartoon, but I like his commitment to it. It's like these things happened in the Star Wars universe and I'm not going to change them because, you know, to to appeal to an audience. This is what happened. So I'm going to tell this story. And you're right. They have all of these episodes, some of which can be fantastic, but they'll involve characters who might be side characters or something like that. And they involve stuff that happens that, I don't know. It's I. I don't quite know how to describe it, but he does a very satisfying way of telling these stories while remaining committed to it. And I think what where Star Wars went wrong when they got rid of him is they would cave to pressure to change mm. things to so to, to what they thought would be more popular. They tried to subvert expectations with the second sequel. What was it? The Last Jedi. Yeah. And then so. they tried to unsubvert <laughs> expectations with the third one. And so that's literally why in the cinema were... thinking, oh, you didn't like what the director did last time, did you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, it's distracting as you're watching the film. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it was Lucas, I, I say, gave it such a big He wasn't vision. involved in that, was he? No, no, not at all. He had his plan. And he told Disney, yeah. um, and they did their own thing, which uh, I think is a very interesting move on Disney's part. Um, Not necessarily a very good one. Oh no, no, it's it's like an interesting yeah. experiment. You see, you see the Star Wars without Lucas's input, um, and he had and trained you... his apprentice Dave Filoni, so he's there ready. That's you know part of why the Mandalorian so amazing. Yeah, and you think of the, the you know the Force Awakens. A lot of people said it was like so derivative of of Star Wars, and then you had the Last Jedi, which very consciously tried to subvert expectations. But because you yeah. expected a formula, it was unsatisfying. You expected Luke to pick up the lightsaber and go and have the space <laughs> combat, and in the end, he was like, you know, he was he was not the character that you thought he would be. No, for me, the the way it fell down is it's not so much about expectations. Again, personal view, it was about this is a fictitious universe, right? When yeah. James Bond is like, London's going to be destroyed unless I do something. I, I'm vaguely aware of London. I've been there. Um, yeah. I'm not that familiar with it. Istanbul. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it's going to get destroyed and the world is not enough. Oh, my goodness. Whereas if you have a completely fictitious universe, how do you get people's investment? You have to build it as real. So there must be rules, like we said about the Mandalorian. So you set up rules, they follow. If you break them, there's consequences. The Last Jedi kind of threw all the rules of the universe out the window. So suddenly I'm like, hang on, this is supposed to be a universe. How can I get invested in saving a universe if the rules were thrown out the window and it doesn't make sense? Um, I think you're absolutely right. And that's and maybe that's where part of what formula is comes in you establish the rules and therefore Mm. you have a kind of repetitiveness because your characters have to follow the rules otherwise it doesn't make sense yeah i'm immediately pulling out from uh the disney film oh the one with magical elsa and his frost powers oh frozen Yes, yeah, and it has her sister with some fellow, and it has the the stereotypical disney moment as as they start to fall in love and she was something like if only if only i was in love with you or if only you were beautiful yeah. or something. And I'm like, oh, shocked. I mean, this is a Disney film I can watch. There's no talking animals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. It, it's subverting expectations done well. That was a good twist, actually. And I, um, 
it's funny i watched frozen 2 and i was like oh wow i get my copy of save the cat and i'm ticking through but it was a satisfying movie because of both <laughs> things and like and you need a twist as lee child said a good story has a twist at the end but the twist has to be something unexpected yet satisfying and makes sense with the rest of it you can't do an agatha christie and mm. the end of uh oh what is it the orange express that's kind <laughs> of like a cop out whereas what you want is something twisty and unexpected but you do it and you're like oh that makes sense that's satisfying yeah as long as it was set up somewhere at the beginning i think you mentioned chekhov's gun earlier in a yes. previous podcast and I'm like it, it can't just randomly come from nowhere yeah and you plant these little seeds. I watched Ni- the second Knives Out movie yesterday, The Glass mm. Onion, and it was interesting where they had certain seeds that then paid off afterwards. And it's that dopamine thing I was talking about. When you have seeds and you you notice them and then they get paid off, you get that little rush and you're like, oh, I'm so smart. I noticed that they swap drinks. And now you can see that that was an important plot point. And aren't I smart? I'm as smart as the guy who wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed Glass Onion. I, I watched it when it came yeah. out uh, in the UK and... Uh... It's good fun. It's just fun. Yeah. I mean, uh, Daniel Craig's obviously having a whale of a time with that accent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and living with Hugh Grant. I love that as well. That was good. Yes. I'm happy to see him. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the secret star of Paddington Bear, too. I mean, obviously, Paddington's the star. And then you've got, you know, the Irishman in it. But, you know, he was good. The star turn. <laughs> But yeah, Knives Out 2 is a great example. You know, they had Knives Out and then they made a sequel. And it's like, OK, I've now established a formula. Mm. It's like we've got to have Benoit Blanc has to be involved in this mystery somehow. But then he can't he starts off being like a, 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 a hokey southern person. But then you realize that actually he came in here because he already knew what was going on. And that was satisfying and all these things. And he's created a formula for these movies, even though they're only two movies. And I believe they're making a third one. And now it's going to be whatever the title is, a Benoit Blanc mystery. Oh right, okay, well, that's good. Um, they called it a knives. Really yeah, they called the second one a knives out mystery because Benoit Blanc as a character wasn't established enough, but now he is. Okay. Oh, cool. Yes. So then we've got some good examples of formulas. Yes, but uh, you're right though. There are the bad examples of formula where things are just the same, mm. uh, and almost the point that it's. Yeah, you almost feel insulted by it. Yes. Um, there was the there's a channel here in America called the Hallmark Channel where they mm. do all of these these cheesy romance movies. Uh, and the, the chap I mentioned earlier, Dan Harmon, who invented the story circle, he let, wrote an article about how um, Hallmark filmed a movie called Sister Swap or something, and it was one sister lives in the country and one sister lives in the big city, and they swap places for the holiday season. They filmed one movie. And then they edited it into two movies and one focused on the sister going to the big city and the other focused on the sister going to the country. And it was kind of like, and it's because romance is such a formulaic thing that you can film all the stuff and edit it together and have a satisfying story. But at that point you're like, okay, this is a bit much where you film one movie and you get two movies out of it. Oh, I don't know. I think that's a really interesting kind of idea. Like I say, well, two of my favorite Star Wars projects, a trilogy of novels and a standalone novel, which is actually quite big. But the way they interlock and intersect is very cleverly done. Um, I'm hoping the Hallmark movie was cleverly done. Should I get this DVD box set of the two movies? Yeah, I might have to watch it, actually. It's just uh, I mean, Dan Harmon said it was very good, actually. And you think I think a lot of people, you know, they they make fun of romance. But romance is a formula that works when you write a romance book. You know, you have alternating chapters between the male hero and the female heroine and they have to meet in the first chapter and then they have to have a soft breakup because of a misunderstanding and then a hard breakup from some insurmountable problem and then they resolve that problem and they have their happily ever after and it has to fit these beats and if they don't the readers complain about it do you find it difficult to fit to the beat what what if you have an idea and you powerfully don't want to fit to a certain beat you want to do something different what's Mm. I think if you're an established author, you can pull that off. But to me, I enjoy trying to finagle a story into the beats. I think of it okay. like poetry. Hmm. It's like you have a you have a haiku and it's, you know, it's uh, what is it? Five syllables, 10 syllables, five syllables. Is that right? Or you have a sonnet, which is 10 syllables, 10 syllables, 10 syllables or a yeah. poem where. Um, and so you get your you think of your narrative, what happens in the story. And it's like, how am I going to tell this? in the framework of the story it's like okay i've got this love story but when i'm telling it i want the hero and heron to meet at the end of the first chapter 
but all of this stuff happens before for each of them. Oh. How do I do that? And then it's like, okay, we'll bring in the characters this way and then maybe have a flashback this way, or maybe we'll talk. And it's kind of satisfying to get your story oh. and and force it into the shape of the story circle. Oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. It's all, and it's it's really enjoyable. And I mean, there was one book I wrote. I was just I poured out this book. It was two hundred and sixty thousand words by the end of it, which is ridiculous. And so I read it again, and like the first hundred thousand words were actually a self-contained story. So it was like, and then the next hundred and sixty thousand words, I had to throw out forty thousand words, and I had to Oof. rewrite all this stuff because I was like, it needs to follow a formula. You can't just write what happens. You have to write what happens in the formula of a story. Otherwise, it's not satisfying. Ah, I'm I'm eyeing in one corner of the room. I have the book called Union, which is the Star Wars story of Luke Skywalker. Spoiler alert: getting married. Oh, now who did he marry? Ja, ja, um... Mara. Mara, that's it. Mara yeah. Jade, was that right? That's right. Yes. And the comic book writer was asked about you know writing this book because it's a momentous a momentous uh, point in the Star Wars story. But obviously, what can you do with a Star Wars romance? Pe- people see Star Wars on the front cover. They are expecting at yeah. some point a lightsaber battle. They're expecting blaster fire. They're not necessarily expecting a story about finding the perfect wedding dress. That might not sell. But then uh, the writer gave themselves the challenge. Can I put both? <laughs> into yeah. the story um, and so started to take it that way um that was a really interesting way to approach it i really and, and that's what i kind of do i mean my books um to a certain extent i have to admit they are i get inspired by like 80 i wrote one called codename mistletoe and it was die hard as a romance book and it's kind of like okay so we've got the situation of the hero and the heroine and they meet and they're in a skyscraper and it gets taken over by terrorists how can you tell that in a romance story uh. when you've got the elements and you have to like fit it in um and the formula is what helps you you think formula doesn't help you but it does okay I, i'm I thinking used... you know i've only seen it from the audience's perspective i hadn't really thought from the writer's perspective that it would yeah. be so enjoyable uh it's uh, they talk about writing being a craft rather than, mm. rather than an art. And it's like if you're a, a carpenter and you're making a table, it's like, OK, your very basic thing is you've got to have a flat surface that's elevated so people can do stuff on it. And it's like with stories, you know, if you're a love story, you have to have the here and here and get together. But then you need the four legs or maybe you have the one leg with the four bits for stability. But it is at the end of the day, you don't complain you, when a carpenter makes you a table, you don't be like, oh, great, it's another table with four legs. That's so <laughs> boring. Uh, but it has to. To do what it does, it has to follow a structure and you have to craft it as in you get the different bits. And, and as a writer, you're a skilled craftsman if you can you know, craft the words to, to fit into this or you can just cludge it together. Mm. But a badly cludged together story that sticks to formula is better than a really beautifully constructed story that doesn't. Okay. I feel there is a perfect point to end this. And I feel justified that the beginning of all my podcasts start with the exact same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Thomas. Welcome to Albion Never Dies this week. Um, and they always oh, end well, absolutely. with music. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people listen. I listen to you because I know exactly what I'm getting. It's like, I like listening to your podcasts because I know they're 20 minutes in length. So I can, while I'm cooking dinner, it's the perfect length. And I know you're going to wrap things up satisfyingly. And so, yeah, you have a formula and it works. Okay. I enjoy doing it. Now I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've never thought of it that way. Um, but yeah, it's a craft. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the final point, uh, I came from an advertising background. There's a guy called David Ogilvy, who's like one of the greats. And he used to he used to have a quote, which is, give me the freedom of a tightly defined brief. Because mm. if you work with a client and the client's like, I don't really care, I come up with something original, that's a nightmare. What you want is the client to come and say, I want this, 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 and then make it interesting. And yeah. having those four things, it's like it solves the blank page problem. You're like, okay, yes. I know what I have to do, and now I can – be original with that so give me the freedom of a tightly defined brief and it's like give me the freedom of a good formula and it makes storytelling so much easier we can give it straight up with a twist yes <laughs> roland thank you very much for joining me it's been an absolute pleasure and i'm sure roland hume will return <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much thomas <laughs> catch you later
Okay, thank you very much for listening to this episode of British Culture Albion Never Dies. Do check out Roland's YouTube channel if you haven't already, and of course he's on Instagram and all the, all the good places. You can just search his name, Roland Hume, and of course Amazon as well, as he is a published author. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it, because I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you for listening.